So we're going to be looking at the book of Micah today in Hebrew, Micha, and it's a shortened form of his name. Micah would be Micaya, Michaya, who is like God, or who is like Yahweh. And if you want to say who is like God, it's Michael or Michael. So these words are very, very similar. And um, we're going to uh, begin just by praying and reading the first verse and then opening up the context of that verse. So, Father, we just look to you now in Yeshua's name for your illumination of your word, that you would speak to our hearts uh, as Paul prays in Ephesians 1 and 3, that there would be a revelation given to us as believers from your word by the Holy Spirit so that we would move more deeply into your heart understanding and obedience in Yeshua's name. So in Michael 1, we're looking here and it says, The word of Yahweh which came to Micah of Moreshet in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So first of all, Micah, uh, where is he from? Well, it says Moreshet here. And then if we turn to, uh, to Jeremiah, uh, and we're going to see that in chapter 26 of Jeremiah, verse 16, verse 17, well, 16, it says, Then the officials and all the people came, said to the priests and to the prophets, No death sentence for this man, for he has spoken to us in the name of Yahweh our God. So uh, Jeremiah <laughs> was bringing a prophetic message that people didn't like. And like it says, you know, God says, I gave you prophets and Nazarites. And you said to the Nazarites, drink wine. And to the prophets, shut up. And so that's basically what's going on here in Jeremiah 26. He's being told to be quiet. And they are basically have a legal reeve against him, a, a star chamber. And they're going to lynch him as being a prophet. And... Um, People, officials and people say to the priests and to the false prophets, don't hurt him. He's only telling you the word of the Lord. So in verse 17 of Jeremiah 26, And some of the elders of the land rose up and spoke to all the assembly of the people, and they said, Micah of Moreshet prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah. And he spoke to all the people of Judah, saying, This is what Yahweh of armies says. Zion will be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem will become ruins, and the mountains of the house as the high palaces of a fo- the mountain of the house, that's Harabait, as we say in Hebrew, the Temple Mount, as the high places of a forest. Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah put him to death? Did he not fear Yahweh and entreat the favor of Yahweh, and Yahweh changed his mind? Here's that Jonah word again about the misfortune which he had pronounced against them. But we are committing a great evil against ourselves. So here is Jeremiah on trial in front of a lynch mob. And how does he get saved? Because of the book of Micah. They quoted Micah's prophecy here, and Jeremiah was not murdered. And uh, so it's uh, for Jeremiah, he really appreciated Micah, uh, as you can imagine. And uh, so we're going to look at this thing here. And in, in Micah chapter 1, um, I believe verse 14, it talks about, um, therefore you will give parting gifts on behalf of Mor- on behalf of Moreshet Gat. So Moreshet means inheritance. Gat is the wine press or olive press. So somebody received this an inheritance in olive press. That's where uh, Micah was from. And uh, he prophesied concerning Israel or Samaria and Jerusalem as well in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. So let's take a look a little bit at what's going on at that time. Well, first of all, in Babylon, right at this time, you have Tiglat-Pileser, who was the famous Assyrian king, and we've seen pictures of him before. And then uh, you have, uh, after him, comes a king called Sargon II. And Sargon was involved in uh, um, coming against Lachish. So all those pictures of the Jewish people being taken off into exile and ripped in two and stuff. That's from the time of um, uh, both um, um, 
Tiglat Pileser and, and Sargon. So here's a picture of Sargon, how he looked, the Assyrian king. And um, then we get into what they did. Again, the pictures of the Jewish people being destroyed by them and taken off into exile. So at this time, this is when Micah is living. He's a uh, contemporary of Isaiah and a contemporary of Hosea. Isaiah was in Judah. Hosea was in the north. And uh, and uh, Micah was also from Gat, which is in the area of Judah in the south. But he was sent with a message to Jerusalem and also to Samaria. And this is, again, one of the servants of uh, Jeroboam II here. Uh, what would this be here? Well, this is Ahaz, one of the kings, or Ahaz. Uh, this is a seal found with Ahaz's uh, mention here on this. Uh, and here is one of Tiglat Pileser's inscriptions mentioning uh, both uh, uh, um, two kings. He's mentioning, um, let me think now for a second, which one? He's mentioning uh, Ahaz, and he's mentioning also, I think, Menachem from the north as well on this inscription. Uh, here's a picture of King Hezekiah. It's his seal that was discovered from Jerusalem. See the wings? So Assyria used it, the paratroopers for Britain used it, King Hezekiah used it. It was a symbol of being an eagle, kind of flying above everything here. And Hezekiah was also the one who built the tunnel. And this is the original plaque in the tunnel, that uh, Hezekiah's tunnel, where they took the waters of the Gihon Spring and brought it to the Pool of Siloam. Uh, that's ancient Hebrew, the way it used to look. It's different from modern Hebrew in the way it looks. Same words, just different letters. And this is a scroll with the name of Isaiah that was also found in that area as well. So these are real people. These are things that they used. Isaiah would have touched that. It's very small. It's a seal around your neck. Okay. So here we are in Micah 1 talking about the vision. It says here uh, in verse 2, Hear, O peoples, all of you, listen, O earth, and all it contains, and let the Lord God, Yahweh God, be a witness against you, Yahweh from his holy temple. So here is Jerusalem in Hezekiah's day. You can see the irrigation systems that Solomon helped build down on the bottom. You can see uh, the pool of Siloam down there, uh, and the temple is way on top. So this is <clears throat> the Jerusalem that uh, Micah uh, would have known when he would have gone up there as well. And uh, basically what he's saying here is verse 3 of Micah 1. Behold, Yahweh is coming forth from his palace. He will come down and tread on high the places of, on the high places of the earth. And basically it's saying here in verse 5, why is this? The rebellion, Pesha, rebellion against God and against the house of David, the rebellion of the house of Israel. What is not the rebellion of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what is the high places of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? So he's saying, same problem, rebellion against God and his authority, against his teaching, his Mosaic covenant, and those who were teaching it against the prophets, against the priests, against the king. And establishing kings, prophets, and priests who are not in obedience to God's heart. So verse 6, I will make Samaria a heap of ruins in the open country. I will pour her stones down into the valley. Her idols will be smashed, etc., etc., and so what he's saying here basically is there's going to be an invasion of uh, Assyria. And that's going to take the ten tribes into captivity. And here they also took the Judean fortress of Lachish into captivity. This is from that time. That's King Sennacherib sitting there on the right. And then he begins to describe in chapter 1 a kind of a, an analysis of neighborhoods going through uh, Jerusalem. And how uh, the King Sennacherib will be coming against um, uh, uh, Jerusalem uh, and the various places that he's going to be. He'll be in Gath, Beit Ophra, Shafir, Tsa'anan, Beit Etzel, Marot. All these places that he's moving as the Assyrian is invading the land here. And it says here, Harness the chariot to the team of horses, O inhabitants of Lachish. 
She was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, because in you were found the rebellious acts of Israel. So we just saw pictures of Lachish. It's mentioned right here that there was going to be this uh, huge destruction of that fortress here. So he's basically charting out the news before it happens. He's saying this is the way the Assyrian armies gonna, is going to march in here. And he's saying actually Samaria or Shomron infected Zion with their sin. And then he uses some puns in Hebrew. Uh, he talks about Marisha and Adulam. And then in verse 14, he says here, the houses of Arziv will become a deception. In Hebrew, it's a pun. The word achziv comes from the same word achzava, which means deception. So he's saying you're going to not only be called deception, but your idolatry is a deception. There's no security in it. It's interesting that you, uh, in Hebrew, well, that's a different issue. We won't get into that here. So uh, moving on to, to chapter 2, we see Assyria coming and invading, taking Israel away. Um, and this is what the book is dealing with prophetically, how this captivity is about to happen and uh, because of the judgment. So that's how the book starts. That's just to get your attention. Okay. Then in chapter 2, Micah begins to talk about what's going to happen uh, specifically to, to Israel. So let's, let's look at that here. In uh, Micah 2, he says, Woe to those who scheme iniquity, who work out evil on their beds. When morning comes, they do it. It's in the power of their hands. These people can't get to sleep because they're scheming about all the wicked things they're going to do all night. He says that's kind of what's going on here um, in, uh, in Israel and in Samaria. And he says, basically, they're trying to do property deals, uh, and um, they're robbing everybody, and everybody's hand is against each other. And then he finally basically says, uh, I'm going to bring judgment on you because of the social injustice. He says, between verses 3 and 11, you want to be a leader in Israel? Offer free liquor to all the people, and that'll make you a leader. Uh, you're not going to be a godly leader, but you're going to be a um, uh, a popular one. Basically, he's saying Israel is filled with social injustice warriors, people who are not doing the right thing. And that's a very, very sad description, uh, talking about uh, if you want to offer wine and liquor in verse 11, he would become the spokesman for the people. So then in verse 12 and in verse 13 of that same chapter, he says, I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. So the remnant refers to those who've survived some terrible uh, tragedy and those who are faithful can be either one of those. I will put them together like sheep in the fold and like the flock in the midst of its pasture, they will be noisy with men. So he's saying, I'm going to regather uh, the Jewish people, and they're going to be like a huge amount of sheep, a lot of productivity, a lot of noise. I gather them, the land will be full of the Jewish people. And then it says here, the breaker, haporetz is the Hebrew term, will go up before them. They break out, they pass through the gate, they go out of it. So their king goes on before them, and Yahweh is at their head. So... This is a messianic prophecy that in the midst of Israel being scattered, one day she will be regathered. You can go to the same thing in uh, uh, various places in Isaiah and Ezekiel when it talks about God regathering the sheep uh, to the land of Israel. Uh, Ezekiel 20 is one of those passages, if you're interested, to look at it as well. So he's saying, I have a hope, I'm extending a hope to you that you're going to be regathered again, even though you're going into a terrible exile. And there's going to be one as a shepherd who goes ahead of you, who's going to break out of the walls surrounding you and lead you out of prison. And you're going to be brought through and this, your king goes out ahead of you. So this is a beautiful term. And the Hebrew term is botsra. Kitson Botsra. And uh, 
So uh, you can see where Botzra is, as it mentioned, this, this one. Oh, it's a little bit lower. If you go down here, you can see it over in, uh, in southern Jordan. And uh, so some people actually locate uh, this passage in that area, uh, which is near Petra. Uh, and that's a possibility. Uh, but in any case, the, the poetic image here is definitely that God will bring his sheep back and uh, his sheep would then be brought back into the land of Israel and regathered again. So it's a uh, uh, double emphasis here. The one who breaks out and leads the people out is the king, and Yahweh is at his head. So it's a, a very positive messianic prophecy here. And indeed, among rabbis who study this, not all of them know it, but one of the names of Messiah is Haporetz, based on this passage. So um, it's a messianic prophecy that we're dealing with right here. Okay, so let's move on now a little bit. Another picture of Botsra. It's near in Edom in southern Jordan, as you can see over there. In chapter 3, let's see what we can find here. Um, Oi! Some of this stuff is so hard to look at, you know? It's... Uh, it's like fast food and lots of it. Um, so in chapter 3, I said, Hear now, O heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. So he's talking to <clears throat> both the Jewish people in Judah, in the two tribes, and also in the ten tribes of the north. Is it not for you to know justice? In other words, you should know this stuff. It's in the Bible. You who hate good and love evil... But you also tear the skin off of your people and their flesh you tear off from their bones. You eat the flesh of my people, stripping off the skin from them and breaking their bones, chopping them up as for the pot and putting as meat in a kettle. So he's saying, you're in charge of the people. You collect taxes. You're supposed to arrange for municipal justice, social justice. And instead, you're treating my people like you can just fleece them blind. So you tax them too much, you don't give them justice, and you are involved in political oppression of your own people. It's a very, very sad description here. And he said, basically, like that old Beatles song, you should have known better with a God like me to behave this way. You're eating your own people like mutton. And uh, as they might say, mutton ventured, mutton gained. Basically, you've treated them in a bad way. Uh, the prophets who are supposed to help the Jewish people in chapter 3, verse 5, they're leading my people astray. They're biting them with their teeth. They're crying out, peace, you know, everything's going to be fine. But uh, against him who doesn't pay them enough and put anything in their mouth, they declare holy war. And that's the actual word here in Hebrew. They, they, they holify, they sanctify a war against them. So he's saying the prophets are not here to warn on my behalf. They're basically looking to have a comfortable life where they're fleecing the people and they're not giving a message from me, but nevertheless they're saying it's a supernatural message. I regret to say that sometimes in our day we run into this, even people who, who are known worldwide as prophets and apostles do the same type of thing. So have we learned from the Hebrew prophets? Are we so much more advanced? Who knew the Bible better? Who could speak Hebrew? And so, you know, sometimes they say in French, plus que ça change, plus que ça reste la même. The more it changes, the more it stays the same. So this message here is not just something we say, oh, wow, that must have been really heavy in Micah's day. It's the same in our day. We need a clear word of the Lord. We need character. We need accuracy. We need humility. We need clear revelation, biblically-based revelation. These are the things that were not happening in Micah's day, and they need also to be happening in our day. So continuing in chapter 3, verse uh, 6, it says, Therefore it will be night for you to the prophets without vision and darkness for you without divination. 
The sun will go down on the prophets and the day will become dark over them. The seers will be ashamed. Because it says at the end of verse 7, because there is no answer from God. This reminds me of a couple of things in the scripture, and you probably would remember them as well. One of them is 1 Samuel 28, 6. It's Saul's last night on earth. And he's about to fight his mortal enemy, the Philistines. David is not there. He's gone away because Saul's trying to kill him. And the Philistines are fighting for control of the Via Maris, the way of the sea. They're in the middle of the Jezreel Valley. And they're on the east side of it, right near Mount Gilboa. And Paul's on top of Mount Gilboa. Well, not, not quite yet. That was later in the day. But earlier on in the day, he's at a place called uh, Endor, the Spring of Dor. And uh, right over there, he says, God's not answering me. God used to answer me. There were prophets, people like Samuel. Samuel's not around anymore. David's not here. There's no favor. God's not speaking to me. I need to know. And so he calls the witch of Endor, and she raises up Samuel from the dead in a very rare occurrence. And so this issue of God not answering, it's a judgment. When we don't hear from God in the Bible, that's a judgment. It's not normal. We've made it theologically normal. We've said, you know, no one hears from God anymore. That's, that's something happened very rarely and unusually a long time ago in a country very far away. God says, no, you don't hear from me? That's a problem. And uh, again, another passage would be Daniel 2. How does Daniel come into his calling in the land of uh, uh, Babylon there? Uh, he comes in uh, because the soothsayers and the fortune tellers don't hear any spiritual message. They can't understand the dream. There was a setup. Remember, the king got a dream, and he said, I'm not going to tell you what the dream is. You need to give me the dream and the interpretation so I can depend on a supernatural source. And they said, God, uh, Almighty King, uh, we don't do it that way. No one does it that way. You give us the dream, we give you the interpretation. And he says, you know what? You're all dying. And uh, they said, what are we going to do? That's where Daniel says, there is a God in heaven. Maybe he'll give me some revelation. So he prays, and in the middle of the night, he gets this revelation. And Daniel says in Daniel 2.27, there is a God who answers. So even though when people don't have answers, God has an answer. So it's a very important thing here. These prophets don't have answers. They've literally had source of revelation turned off, period, whether it be from clean or unclean spiritual sources. So what does then Micah say about himself in chapter 3, verse 8? On the other hand, I am filled with power, with the spirit of Yahweh, with justice and courage to make known to Jacob his rebellious act, even to Israel, his sin. Now, it's interesting here that the focus of the prophetic ministry that he's talking about here is not to say, next year is going to be so wonderful for you, the stock market's going to change. It's none of that. What he's saying is, I'm filled with the Spirit in order to declare the sin of Israel, the Great Commission, what God requires of you. A very different focus on prophecy. How did we get off from what the Bible says about what the prophetic is supposed to be? Why do we not have clear voices? Why are people silent like mostly happened at 9-11? This is not something that speaks well to us, but this is the same thing that happened in Micah's day, and it's a really strong challenge here that we're running into. Ein ma'ane Elohim. God is not answering us, and it's a terrible thing. Okay, moving toward the end of chapter 3, basically from verses 9 through 12, he said, people who are leading the contractors, the legal authorities, the uh, governmental authorities. It says judges are accepting bribes. High priests profits, uh, make declarations for a price. Prophets get paid graft in order to give positive prophecies. Yet they say they're leaning on, the, on Yahweh and saying, isn't Yahweh in our midst? Calamity will not come upon us. Verse 12. 
Therefore, on account of you, Zion will be plowed as a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the temple will become high places of a forest. This is the famous prophecy that saved Jeremiah's life. And it comes in the context of Israel being disobedient in the mid-700, 750 to 740 B.C. And it had an effect then later on Jeremiah around something like 600 B.C. So it shows you that the messages of these two prophets is not that different. Uh, but this was a, a really powerful and significant um, event going on here. And because of this prophecy, uh, Jeremiah was saved to minister. And so Micah and Jeremiah are uh, like tag team wrestling in the prophetic when you put them together here in this book. And again, it's very sad stuff. Uh, and we're used to looking to the prophetic only for happy stuff. Maybe that means we're so much more moral these days and we're walking in so much greater righteousness than the Jews did a long time ago. I don't think so. So as we're finishing chapter 3 and we were talking about, um, what was the name of that uh, king who went to the uh, witch of Endor? Uh, his converted name was Paul, but his, uh, his Hebrew name was Saul. A lot of people talk about Saul and Paul. It's not an equivalent name. It's just uh, using a name that Gentile people would understand. It wasn't like the name has a real spiritual prophetic significance. He took a name which sounded similar to Saul. Anyway, King Saul was the one. I said Paul, but I meant uh, Saul, um, the one who was asked for from God. So we were looking at chapter 3, and we talked about how Zion would become a plowed field, and this was the prophecy that saved Jeremiah's life. Here's a picture going back quite some ways uh, back in the 18, late 1800s, and you can see how uh, Jerusalem, which today is totally <laughs> filled with buildings, that's Siloam, Silwan. It's totally filled with buildings today, everything here. But for years it was a plowed field, nothing there. And uh, again, this is recent. They didn't have pictures going back uh, 2,000 years ago. But uh, that prophecy came to pass, and you can still imagine it if you know where to go to and look. Okay, so now uh, we've left the mountain of the Lord's house being destroyed and turned into a grove of wild animals. And then we come to, all of a sudden, a total jump to another period of time, and that's in Micah 4. And Micah 4 I want to read this to you. Uh, going to be five verses here, the beginning. And it will come about in the last days, acharit hayamim, the same term about the very end of days, that the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills. We're talking about geographical changes going on. And it says that the Mount Moriah today will be the highest mountain on earth. You say, well, that sounds like maybe a fairy tale. Well, this is what it says here. And if you go to Isaiah 40 and it talks about hills being laid low and, and valleys being exalted, you're talking about major changes. Isaiah 24 through 27 talks about earthquakes and the earth shaking on its foundations in those days. The book of Revelation talks about these things, too. These are not allegories, guys. These are real descriptions of things which are going to happen here. And it says that the mountain of the Lord's house will be exalted higher than any mountain on earth, and the peoples will flow or stream to it. Now, if you uh, say, wait a second, are we in Isaiah here or, or Micah? Well, Micah 4 and Isaiah 2 are nearly word for word the same. So there's three possibilities. Micah took it from Isaiah. Isaiah took it from Micah. Or God gave both of them the same message at the same time. We don't know which one it is. But they did know each other. Okay, Micah was from the south. Isaiah was from the south, from Jerusalem area. And uh, they're talking about the same thing. So they're talking about the full 
uh, restoration of the Jewish people here. Many nations will come and say, Come, let's go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob. So this presupposes a couple of things here. One, it's happening. Two, the nations accept that it's happening. And three, there's a temple being rebuilt. Now, if you ask most Christians today, they would say no, no, and no. But this is what he's teaching. Are the Jewish people being regathered? Yes. Are they in charge of Jerusalem? Mostly. And uh, has the temple been built? No. So we could get into that. We talked about this when I taught on Ezekiel. But for right now, this is a reality being talked about. Come, let's go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways and we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion, or from Zion, will go forth the teaching. The Hebrew word there is Torah. Torah means teaching. A teacher in Hebrew is Morah, and the teaching is Torah, same basic word. Yara is the root. Even the word of Yahweh will come forth from Jerusalem. So it's saying here that God himself will teach us. So let me ask you a couple of questions if I can. I know it's hard for you to answer here, but it's worth thinking about. The first one is who's teaching It says God is teaching us. Well, of course, that must be symbolic. Or is it? Do we believe that Yeshua is coming back to Jerusalem? It actually says that in Zechariah 14 and other passages. And so if he's coming back to Jerusalem and he's going to sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem, it says he's going to teach the nations. What covenant will he be teaching? It says in Hebrews that Yeshua is the mediator of a better covenant, the new covenant. How much do you and I know about the new covenant? Well, we say we study the New Testament, yes. But as far as a legal document, how much do we know about the new covenant? Where do we look? Most of the new covenant has not yet been communicated to us. And we're waiting for this day when Messiah himself will teach us about the new covenant. Now we know some things. It says in Matthew 5 through 7, you know, uh, people say to you, you know, don't commit adultery, but I say if you look upon a woman with a lust in your heart, you've committed adultery in your heart already. People say, well, that's the new covenant. I'd say, no, that's actually the Mosaic covenant. Yeshua was teaching on the intent of the Mosaic covenant, where God is saying it's not just a matter of committing adultery, but what's going on in your heart? God cares about the human heart from Adam. When he said, Adam, where art thou? He didn't say it in King James. He said, Ayeka in Hebrew. But it's the same concept going on. So here, Messiah will actually be communicating to us and teaching us. He will teach us his ways so that we can walk in his paths because it is Zion will go forth the law. So if we read this word in in, uh, English, we say, wow, or if we read it in the Messianic Bibles, it says Torah. Let's not get confused. Torah does not mean in the Bible the Mosaic Covenant necessarily. It means teaching. So the question is, it's what kind of teaching? God talks about my Torahs that I teach you, and he talks about my Torah that I teach you. And so if it's Mosaic Covenant, that would be Mosaic Torah. Abraham followed God's laws and his teachings, and we don't know what Torah Abraham had. It's not the Mosaic. Galatians 3 makes that very clear to us, and so does Genesis. So what's going on here? The word Torah here means the new covenant teaching. Unfortunately, many Messianic Jews are confused about this, and we don't teach it correctly. And so we're teaching that, you know, Yeshua is going to be a rabbi, like a Hasidic rabbi, and he's going to come and he's going to unroll the scroll of Moses and he's going to sit and in kind of a fiddler on the roof accent, he's going to teach us about how to keep the Mosaic Covenant. That's not what this passage is saying. Messiah's coming, he's going to teach us, and it's going to be the new covenant. 
Verse 3, And he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. We're talking about the United Nations moving its headquarters and going through a spiritual transformation and establishing itself in Jerusalem with Messiah leading the United Nations. I think probably most of the anti-Israel resolutions that it spends 70-80% of its time working on will no longer happen. Okay? So it's going to be a UN in Jerusalem. Okay? And then it says in the middle of verse 3, Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they train for war. So what they're saying here is, and this is the statue at the UN, um, the sculpture uh, of this prophecy from Isaiah 2 and Micah 4. uh, And I was born on UN Day, so it's a precious thing to me, but I'm looking forward to this UN here in Micah 4, three and four and not the one that goes uh, beside the East River, which is not United Nations. There was a um, folk singer, rock and folk singer, um, who taught the Beatles how to play uh, uh, clawhammer guitar. His name was Donovan. And he had a song, uh, Better Get Into What You Gotta Get Into. Get it, better Get Into Now, No Slack and Please. The United Nations ain't really united. Any organization really ain't organized. So he didn't know the truth of what he was saying. He probably didn't know Micah 4, but that's what Micah is saying too. The United Nations will only work when it's centered in Jerusalem and headed by the Messiah. It's not working right now. So there will no longer be military colleges. No, there will no longer be war colleges. You're not going to have that uh, anymore. Military industries probably are not going to exist anymore. Now the thing about this That can't happen just by people saying, we decide. It can only happen when people are cleansed of their murderous spirits, when they're no longer going to raise their hand to destroy the kingdom of God and throw stones against him, when they're no longer going to try to murder the Jewish people and throw them off their land. It doesn't happen before then. If you stop military industries and people's hearts are not changed, all you do is you're setting yourself for an, uh, setting yourself up for another Hitler. Here, it's because there's a full repentance of mankind that these things happen here. And then he continues, he says, it's not only general, it's specific to Israel. So chapter 4, verse 6 through 8, In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble, declares Yahweh, I will assemble the lame and gather the outcasts, even those whom I have afflicted. So this is using Isaiah 40 and 41 language uh, to talk about the return of the Jewish people to their land. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcasts will become a strong nation and Yahweh will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on and forever. And as for you, tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you it will come, even the former dominion will come, the kingdom of the daughter of Zion. Of Jerusalem. So he's saying here, I'm going to come, I'm going to rule from Jerusalem over all the nations. And and he says, the tower of the flock, this is a tower, like a watchtower in a shepherding field. And he says, that's parallel in Hebrew to, to the hill of the daughter of Zion. So the flock here, the tower of the flock is the hill of the daughter of Zion, which is Jerusalem. Now I know there's somebody who decided that they were going to make a killing on this verse, and they said they found a tower of the flock somewhere near Bethlehem, and they were selling shares in this stuff. And you can actually help fulfill this prophecy. <laughs> Oi, that's not what it's saying at all, okay? It's saying basically, Jerusalem, you're the daughter of Zion, you're the tower of the flock, and dominion's going to come back to you. The former dominion. The Davidic dominion, it'll come back to Jerusalem and rule over the whole world here because Yeshua comes to you. So now in verse um, 9 through through chapter 5, verse 1, we're going to see something uh, strong. It's a strong message, so please uh, bear with me here. 
As we know, chapter 5, verse 2 gets into the Christmas, the Bethlehem birth, uh, and that's a beautiful passage, but something happens before then. So let's look at this here. Israel, <laughs> in um, Micah 4, verse 9 and 10, is described as a woman going into labor pains. And she's writhing, trying to give birth. Uh, and it basically says your labor pains are going to involve you getting exiled from Jerusalem. You're going to be taken to a far land. You're going to dwell in the field. You're going to go out of the city and go to Babylon. And so this prophecy now Micah gives, just after this incredibly beautiful statement about everything's going to be fine, then he comes back to the present and says, but in the meantime... It's not going to be so fine. You're going out to exile, and you're going to be screaming like a woman in childbirth here. And then he says, uh, there the Lord is going to rescue you. There Yahweh will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. And when he hits the word enemies, the prophecy begins to focus on those enemies, and he describes something which is powerful here. It's not the only place in Scripture. It's mentioned... Uh, in uh, Isaiah 41, verse 14 through 16. Um, matter of fact, why don't we go there for a second now, just to look at that. Isaiah 41. Now, this is something very few people touch on because it deals with war, it deals with Israel's success in war, and it deals with Israel's success in war against the nations who hate it. So already those are three strikes, and most people don't want to touch that issue, but the prophets do. So let's look at it. Isaiah 41, verse 14 through 16. Do not fear, you womb Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, declares Yahweh. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I have made you a new, sharp, threshing sledge with double edges. You will thresh the mountains and pulverize them, and you will make the hills like chaff. We talked before um, about a threshing sledge. Uh, I believe in Amos, how in chapter 1, Damascus took threshing sledges and ran them over Israeli soldiers and murdered them, decimated them. And God says, I'm going to judge you. But here Israel is called to be the threshing sledge of God on the hills and mountains. This is a biblical term used in Daniel for the nations. And he says, you will winnow them, the wind will carry them away, and the storm will scatter them, but you will rejoice in the Yahweh, you will glory in the Holy One of Israel. So this concept of Israel being called as a threshing sledge prophetically to the nations to judge them militarily. Not very many people are talking about that, but it's in the Bible and it's coming up, guys. So I really encourage you, I exhort you to start studying this image and look at it and see what happens. Now over here it says... Um, in verse 11 of, of Micah 4, it says, Now many nations have been assembled against you who say, Let her be polluted and let our eyes gloat over Zion. It's like a bunch of uh, rapists gathering around saying, Let's pollute Zion. Let's pollute the daughter of Zion. We're going to destroy her. Laughing and gloating. It's our time. And God says in verse 12, But they do not know the thoughts of Yahweh. They do not understand his purpose. For he has gathered them like sheaves to the threshing floor. So arise and thresh, daughter of Zion. For your horn I will make iron, and your hooves I will make bronze, that you may pulverize many peoples, that you may devote to Yahweh their unjust gain and their wealth. To, to the Lord of all the earth. So he's saying something very heavy here. He says, Israel, I'm raising you up as an army to pulverize nations. Who's teaching on this? Well, Ezekiel 37 is. That's the army in Ezekiel 37. And God says, I'm bringing Israel back to the land in unbelief, and then I'm going to put my spirit on them in verse 9 through 11 of Ezekiel 37. And I'm going to turn them into a huge army. It says, Chayel Gadol Me'od Mo'od, an army, a big one, much, much. So that's one of the main purposes of Israel coming back to the land that no one's just about teaching on because it involves military stuff. But that's a prophecy 
that's in Ezekiel and it's in Micah and it's in many other places in Scripture as well. And he says here, basically, I'm going to use Israel to thresh and winnow and pulverize many peoples as an offering. And the word here is cherem. It's a word used when Joshua puts cities under the ban in the book of Joshua. It means literally to devote them as a burnt offering to the glory of God who triumphs over his enemies. It's a hard concept, isn't it? It's a biblical one. And uh, if you look at 2 Kings 25, verse 6 and 7, you'll see uh, what happened here, um, which is kind of connected to chapter 5, verse 1, about uh, troops gathering against the, the, the king, uh, the judge of Israel, and smiting him on the cheek. This is what happened in 2 Kings 25, verse 6 and 7, when King Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, fled uh, when Jerusalem collapsed, when the Babylonians were coming in, and he was captured taken to a place called Riblah, uh, and uh, his sons were killed in front of him. So there's no more dynasty from his side. And then his eyes were put out, so the last thing he ever sees is his sons murdered in front of him. Then he's taken as a prisoner to Babylon, and it says a little bit later, the king said, okay, you can have change of clothes every few months and make sure you can eat nice food. Uh, but very, very heavy uh, stuff that happened. And that was seven kings after this king in the days here of Micah. So he goes back and forth between some things here, some very positive things and some very negative things. And um, so this description of Israel as a threshing sledge, one of the, the high points of the book of Micah, so as we look at what's happening in the world, you know, we've got peace treaties breaking out left and right. Everything's going to be fine. Guys, it's not true. I'm happy for peace treaties. I'm happy when people eat hummus with each other instead of killing each other. But ultimately, it says all the nations of the world are going to come against Israel. And this is what brings the Messiah back. So let's not miss that. Let's not get so excited about little peace treaties made that we forget the Bible. Because the Bible has a lot of clear teaching about that, and most news people wouldn't know how to find a Bible even in a hotel room. Uh, so um, something to think about over here.